from around 1.5 trillion to now over 1.8 trillion. And I think uh, the budget deficit, the fiscal deficit, will come in at, say, around $2 trillion minimum. And I doubt it will decline very much in 2010. So as the government debt grows, and that's always the case, if you have a company and you start out with a debt equity ratio of one to one and suddenly you have debt that are five times your equity, then obviously the quality of your debt is in it. And that is the case now for the U.S. government. Okay, now, former IMF economist Simon Johnson recently said the U.S. was like a third world country with a financial oligarchy in place. Do you see this financial oligarchy emerging in the United States? Yes, I mean, I wrote already two years ago that the U.S. was on the way to the banana republic. And I think the Obama administration, the way it muscles itself into decisions that basically should not be taken by the government, uh, is a, a proof of that. And I would also say that the U.S., if I look at what is being written and what the Fed is doing and the Treasury is doing, then obviously in the long run it will be an inflationary environment. Well, let's see how this is being played in the United States. Apparently on Bill Maher's Real Time on HBO, it's a big joke. Elizabeth Warren, who's the administrator of the $700 billion TARP fund, seems to find it quite amusing that the administration has lost something like $350 billion of that money. The Hank Paulson, the extortionist, uh, is not being uh, indicated in any uh, wrongdoing at all. How are the banks doing? Well, it, there's a little problem with the first $350 billion. <laughs> and what is that? It, it left, and no one's quite sure where it went. Okay, so that was Elizabeth Warren, the administrator for the $700 billion in TARP funds. She said this week she had no idea where the first $350 billion in TARP funds went. It has gone missing. That sounds like Russia to me. Does, does the plunder and corruption uh, have to stop the U.S. to in order for it to recover? Well, I think the problem is that uh, you have very little transparency and that creates, of course, a very volatile market. And I'd also like to point out that the early classical economists like Adam Smith pointed out that in order to gain prosperity, you had to have peace, easy taxes, and a tolerable administration of justice. And I'm sorry to say that the U.S. doesn't have either one. And so the regime in the U.S., the government, is intent on basically bankrupting the country. And uh, this lack of accountability is, of course, a total disaster because, let's say, if you have your own business, you're accountable and you have to pay your tax and so forth. But the government doesn't seem to be accountable. Okay, let's talk about the U.S. dollar for a second. Professor Nouriel Roubini this week said the Chinese yuan could replace the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency. Do you see this happening? I don't think that the U.S. dollar will be replaced right away as a reserve currency or as the world's most important currency. But I think the importance of the U.S. dollar will diminish and that over time the U.S. dollar will become worthless. That is a fairly high confidence uh, prediction I have. It's not going to happen in one year, but say your children's generation will be faced with coffee that costs a hundred or a thousand dollars a cup, or maybe even a million dollars a cup. In that sense, the U.S. dollar will lose its importance. I rather think that we will move back in time to some kind of a gold standard rather than to another paper currency. Okay, so that, uh, hyper, that super inflation you're talking about, that relates to what you were just talking about in terms of the degradation of the U.S. Treasury bond and uh, as it becomes, quote-unquote, toxic. Now, uh, just to follow up on what's happening on the global markets, this week saw threats against the U.S. dollar from Russia, Japan, and China and Brazil say that they plan to axe the dollar uh, and that... Uh, Complaints like this are coming more frequently. So I guess this is what you're talking about. As uh, the next year or two and a couple of years, uh, we see more and more countries abandoning the dollar, and this is kind of a, um, 
uh, you know, euthanasia of the dollar, if you will? Well, I mean, the U.S. dollar is, to, to some extent, the U.S. is still the largest economy in the world, and as such, the dollar will have, you know, for the foreseeable future, some value. But obviously, some countries will start to trade directly with each other, as they've done in the past. And rather than to settle in U.S. dollars, they'll settle in local currencies. Okay, now uh, moving on to U.S. credit uh, ratings. There's been some interesting developments there. Moody's has downgraded Japan's foreign currency bond rating this week. Credit Suisse suggests this opens the way for speculation about whether Moody's will take a similar action on other AAA rating uh, sovereign debt. Um, obviously, this, this is the question of the U.S. sovereign debt. Do you see its AAA rating possibly being downgraded at some point? Well, I think the marketplace has already downgraded U.S. debt, and by the way, other countries said, because if you look at the credit default to upgrade, they've all gone up, and actually the credit market prices U.S. debt at the lower rating in terms of credit default to upgrade than McDonald's. So in other words, McDonald's has a better credit rating than the U.S. government, which I think is uh, deserved, because McDonald's it's still an ongoing business that generates the cash flow, whereas the U.S. government is essentially cash flow negative. Okay, now uh, finally, uh, let's uh, talk about something you mentioned a little earlier and explore that a little bit, which is um, you mentioned that you see a possibility of a return to some degree of a, a gold-backed currency, and um, so I'm curious – uh, what countries, uh, China, I believe, just re increased their um, gold reserves by several hundred tons. So they're obviously been buying gold reserves, gold bullion reserves. How do you see that developing in the next couple of years? Uh, which countries are more aggressive in buying gold? And well, I think don't overestimate the intelligence of central bankers. They will buy gold when it is above $3,000. My only concern is that uh, they will then maybe appropriate gold take it away from prudent investors that accumulate some physical gold in the, uh, in the course of their life. That is the concern I have, because it's dangerous to be right when governments are wrong. Right. So we've seen that in the past. Uh, governments have, in fact, uh, taken uh, gold back from, from the citizens. We've seen that in the U.S. for sure. So this is a risk going forward. So is there um, – this is, uh, of course, people have to, I guess, diversify. If they're looking for gold, uh, they need to kind of diversify into maybe two, two or three ways to own gold as a way to protect themselves against that, or is there, is there any protection against government seizure of gold bullion? Well, I think if you have the kind of policymakers we have in America, and Mr. Bernanke has written about this and he's spoken about this, Thank you, Dr. Mark Faber, editor of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report. Well, that's it for this edition of On the Edge. Next week, we're going to be looking at more banking shenanigans and market manipulation. Until then, bye, y'all.